Good morning. Welcome to Moreland Presbyterian Church. I'm Brian Marsh. I'm the pastor here. It's great to see you all here this morning. Great to have you with us online. And uh, great to have a chance to come together and to celebrate together, um, even with a low humming sound that you may. Just, just assume that that is the drone that is going to continue through our time. Um, no, I think it's one of our organ pipes, isn't it? It's the blower for the organ, working overtime. So glad that you're here this morning. Especially want to welcome those of you who may be newer to our uh, community here at Moreland. We're thankful that you are taking time out of your Sunday to join us. If you would uh, like to find out more about our life together and connect with us more fully, we have these handy-dandy lavender cards that are in the backs of the pews. They're on the seats up here up front. Connect cards. Feel free to fill it out. You can put it in the offering plate or hand it to me. Uh, and uh, we will have a chance to connect more fully. Uh, but whether you are newer to Moreland or Moreland has been your community of faith for a long time, uh, one of the things that we always uh, remember when we gather together and we celebrate this is that we are just a bunch of ordinary people. This is an ordinary church, and yet what connects us together is an extraordinary love. It's the love that gives us life and hope, it encourages us, it comforts us, it also empowers us to be vessels of that love. And so our hope as we're gathered together here today is that each of you in your own way and all of us together would experience the presence of that love in a way that's life-giving, in a way that provides us with hope and empowerment uh, to live our days ahead. So glad that you're here. So glad that Doug Larry, one of our faithful choir members, is here today as our liturgist. And now I invite you to please stand as you are able, and let's join together in our call to worship. Confounded in our souls, we dare to trust in love. Conscripted by our roles, we dare to live out love. Restricted by expectations. We dare to engage new explorations. Reminded that we are incarnations. We dare to live as new creations. Amen. Amen. Our hymn of praise is, I to the hills will lift my eyes. The words you can lift your eyes to see above you on the screen. The music is number 45 in our hymnals. Please be seated. Whenever we do join together for worship and celebration, it's also a time for contemplation. 
time for reflection and release, a time to acknowledge the complexities, the dichotomies, the paradoxicalness of our lives and our world. And so as we enter into a time to reflect and a time to release, uh, we have a unison prayer to say together, and we'll follow that with some moments for silent reflection and release. So together, let's join in prayer. Gracious God, we are living contradictions. We are disconcerted by the discord in our world, our nation, our communities. We are distressed by our disconnection from our planet, our neighbors, ourselves. And yet, so often, we remain apathetic when called to act. We stay silent when called to speak. Please forgive us for all the times our faith is paralyzed by fear. Our compassion is stented by condescension. Our hope is blinded by hatred. Restore our sight into a clearer vision, our minds to a deeper wisdom, our hearts to a broader passion for you, our world, each other, and ourselves. In the name of the one who knows us fully and loves us freely, amen. In all the ways that we are living contradictions, we are embraced by a loving incarnation of understanding, compassion, and grace. In Jesus the Christ, we are accepted, we are forgiven, we are loved. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now please stand as you are able and let's sing our grateful response. We lift our eyes to hills and skies, our hearts with hope alight. Your presence is life's great surprise. Your love, our pure delight. And now, friends, the peace of Christ be with you all. Invite you to turn to one another, share the peace of Christ with one another, and to all of you with us online, peace of Christ be with you all.
Well, uh, I hate to break up the party, uh, but the party can continue. The party continues through our whole time together and into coffee and treat hour down in Fellowship Hall after worship. But at this time, I'd like to invite children of all ages to see uh, David Gluck, our Director of Children's Ministries, who is at the back door. For anyone who'd like to go with David uh, for a special uh, children's time of story. Our readings today are from 2 Samuel, chapter 13, verses 1 through 22, and from 1 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 9 through 13. Sometime later, David's son Amnon fell in love with his half-sister Tamar the sister of David's son, Absalom. Amnon was frustrated to the point of illness over Tamar. She was a virgin and his sister, and he felt it would be impossible to do anything with her. Now Amnon and his cousin, Jonadab, the son of David's brother, Shimea, were good friends, and Jonadab was very clever. Jonadab said, Amnon, why are you sulking around every morning? Tell me what it is that bothers you. Amnon replied, I am in love with Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Jonadab said, go to bed and, be, and pretend to be ill. When your parents come to see you, say to them, I would like my sister Tamar to come and give me something to eat. I want to watch her preparing the food and then have her feed me. So Amnon went to bed pretending to be ill. When David visited him, Amnon said, I would like my sister Tamar to come and make some special bread so that I can watch her preparing it and eat it from her hand. David sent word to Tamar in the palace. Go to the residence of your brother Amnon and pre prepare some food for him. So Tamar went to Amnon's house where he was laying in bed. She took dough, kneaded it, made the bread before him and baked it. Then she took the pan and set the bread on the table, but he refused to eat it. Send everyone away, Amnon said, so they emptied the room. Then Amnon said to Tamar, Bring the food into my bedroom so that I may eat it from your hands. And Tamar took the bread she prepared and took it into Amnon's bedroom. But when she handed it to him, he grabbed her and said, Come to bed with me, sister. Brother, don't, she cried. Don't force yourself unto me. This must not be done in Israel. Don't do such a vile thing. Think of me. Where could I go to hide from my disgrace? And what about you? You would become as low as the most infamous in Israel. Speak to the ruler for me. David would not refuse to let you marry me, but Amnon refused to listen to her, and since he was the stronger, he overpowered her and raped her. Then Amnon was filled with intense revulsion. It was stronger than the love that he had once felt for her. He said, get up, get out of my sight. Tamar replied, no, brother, to send me away is worse than everything you did to me. But he would not listen to her. He summoned, summoned an attendant and said, Get rid of this woman, put her out and bolt the door after her. So the attendant put her out and bolted the door behind her. 
She was dressed in a richly ornamented robe, the kind of garment the virgin daughters of the ruler wore. Tamar put ashes on her head and tore her richly ornamented robe. She covered her face with her hands as she left, weeping loudly. Absalom said to her, Is it your brother Amnon who has been with you? For now, sister, keep quiet about it. He is your brother. Don't brood about it. Forlorn and desolate, Tamar remained in Absalom's house. When David the ruler learned about this incident, he was furious. And Absalom never said a word to Amnon, either good or bad. But he hated Amnon for disgracing his sister Tamar. Moving to the New Testament, Paul wrote, Let us remind you, sisters and brothers, of our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the good news of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, that our treatment of you, since you have become believers, has been just, upright, and impeccable. You likewise know how we treated every one of you as parents do their children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into glory and the kingdom. And we constantly ask God for the way you receive the words we preach to you, not as our word, but as the word of God, which it really was. And it changed your lives when you believed it. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Amen. Well, let's take a deep breath and join together in prayer. Gracious God, some of these ancient words are truly harrowing. They're unsettling. They're disturbing to hear. And yet we recognize that they also reflect parts of human experience. Not just things that happened in the dim and distant past, but remind us of things that happen in our world in the here and now. Into that sense of unsettledness, we ask that by your presence, your spirit, you might bring a sense of calm and peace and a chance to more deeply breathe and reflect and to be able not only to hear these old words in new ways, but also to learn from them and to grow from them. And so may the words of my mouth and the thoughts and dreams and meditations of our hearts be a delight to you. For God, you are our delight. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. So I'd like to uh, begin by asking you a question. Do these men look like prophets to you? How about now? Or now? Well, for those of you not in the know, these are pictures of the group Devo. Devo was created about 15 years ago, 50 years ago, in the early 1970s, uh, as a satirical artistic statement by five highly intelligent and creative and disillusioned and skeptical college students. Students who had sharp senses of originality and humor, but also insight. They used quirky, catchy, in my opinion, brilliant pop music, coupled with cutting-edge visuals and costumes <clears throat> and movements to basically articulate the opposite, the antithesis of where we believe our society is evolving to. 
And they wanted to serve as a playful but also a prophetic voice as to what we could devolve to. Namely, a culture of dumbing down our innate instincts to learn and to expand and to grow. Losing our individuality to conformity. Succumbing to corporate imperatives. Treating people as machines while numbing ourselves with consumption. Now these are trends that haven't exactly reversed over the past 50 years. But Devo is still going at it. And they are actually on their 50th anniversary tour. They'll be playing here in Portland next month, if you're interested. And Gerald Cassell, who was one of the founding members of Devo, spoke to the New York Times recently and said this, that back in the 1970s, we were noticing an exponential increase in a certain kind of dysfunction. And we labeled it de-evolution, or Devo for short. But it was mostly smart-ass college guys being clever. We didn't really think that we'd go where we went as a society. But it's only showing that de-evolution is actually real. And where we are now is far beyond my worst dystopian nightmare. It seems that for all the ways that we have evolved as individuals and as a people, increased capacity for discovery, for innovation, for awareness and acceptance of diversity, we are also devolving in our increasing fear-based divisiveness and polarization and avoidance of others who think or act or live differently than those who are within our preferred silo of what makes sense to us. And yet, this is us. We are a living paradox. Not unlike the paradox we see in our two scriptures for today. The first one is the ongoing, continuing more and more unfortunate saga of David and his family. And we have Amnon, who's David's firstborn, the heir to the throne. We have Tamar, his beautiful half-sister, whom he loves passionately. We have Absalom, his brother from a different mother, who is therefore Tamar's brother. And their crafty friend Jonadab comes along and tells Amnon if he'd like to woo and win his beloved sister, He should fake illness and then call her to serve him food in his quarters privately and then make his move. And unfortunately, the plot works. And Amnon forces himself upon Tamar. Despite Tamar making a very rational request to appeal to David to get married, even though this would involve Tamar marrying a man she doesn't love, a man who is trying to assault her, all in order to avoid that assault and the humiliation that comes with it. But Amnon doesn't listen. And now in the story, we have two violations in a row. Last week, we heard about Bathsheba being violated by David, and this week, it's Tamar by Amnon. And so we see that love isn't really love here, but it's desire gone dangerously and tragically awry. It's feelings of unbearable passion quickly turning to unbearable repulsion. So Tamar douses her perfume with ashes. She rips her virginal dress in mourning now that she's been publicly humiliated. Although in the process, she's also indirectly indicting Amnon, which is really about the closest she gets to a Me Too kind of moment. Absalom hears about all of this, and he's furious, and he responds, but not by telling Tamar to just forgive and forget it, but just to be quiet for a while and hold on to it until the time of vengeance comes. 
David is furious as well, and he does nothing. He says nothing. And that's most likely because of his past egregious actions. And so we see, even in the family system, love is not love. But it's detachment, it's shame that ultimately leads to destruction as Absalom takes Amnon's life. And we're left at the end of this story wondering why? Why did things unravel and get so far out of control and wreak such painful havoc in the lives of this family? And we could put it down to the complexities, the dysfunctions of family systems. We experience within those systems deep cords of connection in supportive and even self-giving love. And we also can experience deep currents of pain and anguish and loathing, even self-loathing, that we can try to alleviate through self-satisfying. Self-satisfying, which dehumanizes other people and turns them into objects that we can disrespect, we can violate, we can humiliate, we can disassociate ourselves from, we can even destroy. Whether it's Amnon to Tamar, or Absalom to Amnon, or David to his family, we're left wondering, where is the love in all of this? And then we fast forward several centuries and hear the contrast of Paul and the emerging community of faith in Thessalonica, a people coming together to create a sacred and safe space, a space of comfort, for those who are hurting, a space of encouragement and empowerment for all of them to live into and live out their calling as children of divine love in Christ, reflecting that calling of Jesus for all of us to embrace and embody the beloved kingdom in childlike simplicity and compassion and wisdom and trust. It's not a group of perfect people. This is not a perfect community, but it's perfect love that enables the community to acknowledge and embrace the dysfunctions and the destructions in their lives and to embody the nurturing and transforming presence of the one who is love. In other words, it's a community that is embodying paradoxicalness. Yeah, I did make that up paradoxicalness, which is both intriguing, kind of sparks our curiosity, but it also can be quite unsettling, disorienting. And sometimes we can respond to that disorientation with despair. Despair over the trauma and grief that arises in times of pain and anguish and loss. We can respond in a disgust that shows itself in a real loathing of our circumstances or even of each other, even of ourselves. A loathing that can lead in this story and in life to destruction. We see that things are wrong and we want them to be made right. And yet often, these kinds of responses, as understandable as they are, they can reflect a kind of polarized, dualistic, either-or kind of thinking. Where, for example, light equals good, darkness equals bad. And in our culture, a Western culture, when we're then presented with an image from an Eastern culture like the yin and the yang, we see light and darkness together in one circle. And in reality, down deep, we don't want the yin and the yang. We want the yin and the yin. Because darkness 
is mysterious and uncertain. And the place where evil and wickedness and brokenness manifest itself. And yet I wonder. I wonder about an image like that and wonder what if it's communicating the reality that delight and destruction are actually present in both. I mean, stop for a moment to consider it. All of creation begins and is formed in darkness. All of us were created in darkness and emerged out of darkness. And we not only see in these ancient stories, we look around our world today and we see atrocities and injustices happening right before our very eyes in the broad light of day. What if it is embracing the yin and the yang, the yin with the yang, that can enable us to respond to challenges with acknowledgement and acceptance and even embrace of all of it? Now, I want to say that embracing paradox, paradoxicalness, doesn't mean blindly accepting all that happens in life, the harrowing and the hallowed. All of these things as being equally valid and meaningful. I mean, when injustice comes, we need to raise our voices and call it out. When we experience grief, we need to allow ourselves to grieve. But I wonder if embracing paradoxicalness is more recognizing and affirming that even the most horrific experiences in life happen within a bigger picture, a broader presence of divine love, out of which something like wholeness and even healing can emerge. And that is the power of paradox, which is actually the power of love. The power that can open our senses and spirits and enable us to live as more fully integrated individuals and communities, yin and yang, in that one circle. I'm reminded of the words of the amazing writer Annie Dillard, who talks about how the stars are ever-present, always shining, but we actually need the darkness to be able to see them. For those of us who identify or connect ourselves to the tradition of Jesus in that bigger realm and radiance and resonance of the presence of Christ, paradoxicalness is not just something that we are called to acknowledge and to embrace. Paradoxicalness is the essence of who we are created to be. I mean, after all, think of some of the imagery in our tradition. Empty crosses, empty tombs, being signs not of absence, but of divine presence. Divine foolishness being wiser than human wisdom. Divine weakness being more powerful than human power. Divine love being stronger than death itself. And death itself being the seedbed out of which emerges new life. And while love, divine love, is who we are, love is also a choice that we make every day and sometimes several times a day. God gives us that freedom. That freedom to choose the way of love which embraces paradox and allows it to empower us and to embody it in affirming and encouraging and even life-giving ways. And yet, the prophets of Devo remind us in one of their songs that while freedom of choice is what we've got, freedom from choice is more often what we want. 
And so maybe the question for me, for you, for each of us today is this. What will I, what will you, what will we choose today? Amen. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for your love and grace, which allows us to appreciate the beauty of your world and the relationships and connections we have with each other. Please provide us with guidance and patience to deal with the trials and tribulations of our daily lives in these troubled times. Help us to address the issues of the homeless, the hungry, the unemployed, the addicted, and the mentally and physically challenged citizens among us. Please give guidance to our world leaders to address the conflicts around the world to allow them to bring a just peace wherever possible. This is especially needed today for the most recent conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians, but is also needed among the many other ongoing conflicts around the world. Finally, dear God, help us to live our lives with the example of the love your Son taught us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. And life goes on for us as individuals and families and neighbors and as a community here at Moreland. And I uh, just want to highlight some of the opportunities to do life together that we have coming up. One is happening uh, shortly after worship. Uh, all of us are invited, as we are each week, to head down to our fellowship hall for coffee and treats and conversation. And then at 11 a.m., right up here in our chapel, will be uh, the continuation of our book discussion group. We are reading and discussing the book Learning to Walk in the Dark by Barbara Brown Taylor, which is a fascinating and powerful study on exploring the darkness and not ch just trying to get out of it, but seeing what gifts are actually present in the darknesses that we walk through. That's happening up in the chapel. Even if you're not reading the book and you're interested in the topic, all are welcome to come and be part of that conversation. Also want to remind us that each week we have two opportunities for scripture conversation, discussion. Tuesday morning is at 8 a.m. at Bob's Red Mill in Milwaukee. Wednesday morning is at 8 a.m. on Zoom. The link is in our e-notes. And uh, all are welcome, all ages and stages and genders, uh, to join in to those very lively and engaging conversations. Also a reminder that our Logos ministry is up and running for the year, and um, all are welcome to come and be involved in this. Whether you are a child, or you know or have a child, uh, whether they are registered or not, they are welcome to come and get connected. And if you are an adult and you'd like to volunteer, we are always uh, looking for more volunteers. So that happens each Tuesday from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. right here. And it involves uh, music with choir and arts and crafts and Bible study learning and a shared meal together and recreation. Uh, we'd love to have anyone and everyone be connected to our Logos ministry. Our Chancel Choir uh, rehearses each Tuesday night, 7 p.m. If you have a voice doesn't have to be a singing voice. Talk to that talented man right there, Evan Miles, who would love to welcome you into that beautiful community as well. Uh, 
The, the, uh, the other things that are happening in our life, you'll see some of them listed uh, on the back of your bulletin. They're in our e-notes, on our Facebook page, and social media and website. I invite you to check out uh, that information there. But I also wanted to remind us that we are in the midst of our season of stewardship. And uh, whether you receive this electronically or via snail mail or both, uh, we have brochures available uh, that highlight our theme for this year, which is open hearts and gen- or open hearts and generous lives, and uh, this is an opportunity for all of us to give thanks for the gifts that we've been given in our lives, our time, our talents, our treasures, our energy and presence, and to consider how we are feeling led to offer those gifts for the year ahead for 2024. Uh, I've invited Cecile Pitts, who is one of our newer attenders, uh, to come forward and to just briefly share uh, her Moreland experience. Uh, Cecile came to us through a way that is much more reflective of our hybrid existence. She came to us online and from there has made interpersonal connections both on Zoom and in person with uh, our Moreland community. And so Cecile, come on up. Being asked to uh, share my uh, journey here um, on stewardship during Stewardship Month is um, quite an honor. And I was thinking about my um, journey, and I thought that I'm going to be kind of like a glitter bomb for you. It's just, you know, glitter. Once it's in your house, it never goes away. Once it's on your clothing, it never goes away. So I'm going to be, you know, Forewarned is forearmed. I'm going to be a glitter bomb. Uh, I am one of six children. I am a cradle Christian. I went to church just about every Sunday of my life until 2019, the end of 2019. And then I uh, started a process of withdrawing from organized church. Um, And as I approached 2020, I thought yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm going to withdraw from organized church. Um, 2020 is going to be my year of clear vision, and I'm just going to see what happens. So we all know what happens in 2020, and um, I end up being unchurched, and um, I had a uh, Buddhist gathering online, eventually online. We meet every week. It's quite wonderful. We meditate Imagine for yourself a Zoom screen with nine people sitting quietly with their eyes closed. That's what we do, yeah. (laughs) And we love it. It's just quite meaningful. But about a year ago, I thought, I I want the same in a Christian Bible study. So I looked around. I needed one during the day, and I needed one not on Tuesday, and I needed one that um, iron sharpens iron and uh, where people are talking, and um, I came across Moreland. And, um, you know, fit right in, well-worn glove. I just, it was wonderful. I just loved it. Um, I want to tell you that starting a new Christian endeavor is um, uh, scary. Or not scary, it's just weird. Because churches know you for generations, and they know you for the seasons of your life. And here I was going to start someplace where nobody knew me at all. So I open up the screen, and there's Barbara. Right, right. I've known, I knew her 30 years ago when my babies were um, babies. And uh, in the background, uh, running around is Cappy. And I've known her the same amount of time. And that, um, so, you know, it begins to feel like I'm known over some, at least some seasons. And um, eventually, I think I want to darken the door. I want to go to a church again. So I um, darken the door of this church thinking, it's a, you know, they're not going to know me for years. They're just not. And that's okay. That's what I've signed up for. That's what COVID and my decisions have done for me. And that's going to be good. And who greets me at the front door but a friend from long ago. And, uh, uh, and during that period of time, she was really important, really important to me. So, and I walk through the door and I see my Bible study friends and I start feeling like, oh, well-worn glove, this feels kind of good. And um, where's the glitter bomb? So here it is. Being away, unchurched, unchurching myself by the end of 2019, COVID hits, 
and then I don't come back until into a church until um, basically now, and um, I came back for the community. So being out of it, I'm going to tell you what it is. Sitting in prayer with people who are praying with me is really important. It's really good. I know that people in the same room, their, their minds are grappling with the holy and wondering if they unplugged the kettle when they left their house. Right. I know that they, their minds are somewhere on this continuum, and that's, that's a goodness. That's a goodness. It's a, it's a glitter. You're with people who are part of this time thinking about the holy, and that's wonderful. Sitting, listening to scripture, reciting scripture, doing the call to worship, hearing people do their um, musical thing, listening to words being made meaning of. It's, um, it's special. Listening with other people is special. Sitting shoulder to shoulder, sitting behind the most beautiful hat lady that you've ever seen with her little worry dolls around her, um, the crown of her hat, right? It's, it's, it's home. It's special. And when I was in it, Cradle Christian, 65 years old, it's, uh, it's still glorious and wonderful, but you forget that being back in it, that it is special. I knew in high school that I had church friends that I could blow it in front of, and high school friends that would never know that I had done that. And that's a wonderful thing. Uh, but you sort of forget that as time goes by, and you forget the glitter of it all. And um, so I want to glitter you with um, how wonderful it is, the thing we do together at church. And um, yeah, it's, I come for the, the glitter. And um, yeah. Thank you, Brian. And you're getting some glitter in response, Cecile. Thank you. And thanks for sharing some of your journey and sharing that image with us. You know, often I, I like to repeat uh, two phrases attributed to Jesus. One is he says, I am the light of the world. And then Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Well, you could say you are the glitter of the world. And what's great about glitter is that once you put it out into the world, it never really goes away. It keeps shining in surprising ways. Friends, remember that, that as you give of yourselves, of your resources, of your energies, your creativity, your time, your presence, that is a gift that shines into this community, into the neighborhood, our city, our world. And it keeps on shining. It never really goes away. So friends, in that spirit, with gratitude to the God who gives us all and makes us to be glitter in this world, let's glitter this space with our gifts and tithes and offerings.
Before we give our thanks to God in prayer, we need to give thanks in celebration in song because we have another birthday girl this week, the wonderful, talented Brenda Sailing's birthday is today. Yes, you can give Brenda a round of applause. Unlike last week, I want to highlight Brenda is not 102 years old. But she's moving one year closer to that this year. And Brenda, we're so thankful for you and for your presence, you and your family, uh, in our Moreland life together for your whole life. What an incredible gift. And so let's lift our voices. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Miranda. Happy birthday to you. Hope you felt the glitter. And now let's give thanks to the one who is the giver of all good gifts through praying the prayer that Jesus taught his first followers to pray, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, holy be your name, thank you come, thy will be done, on earth first is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we are good our debtors, and we are sent to tradition, and deliver us the evil, the vice the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thanks, Ian. Our hymn of sending is, O God Who Gives Us Life. The music is number 53 in our hymnals. And now please be seated for our musical benediction. The Dream Keeper by Langston Hughes. Dream Keeper, bring me all of your dreams, 
you dreamers. Bring me all of your heart melodies, that I may wrap them in a blue cloud cloth, away from the two rough fingers of the world. Langston Hughes is considered one of the most prolific and powerful African-American writers of the 20th century American literature. His verses often reflect the experiences that spoke directly to societal issues of his time, including politics, religion, and racism. The Dreamkeeper depicts the legend of a fictitious character whose role is to protect the dreams of those who are willing to hand over their deepest passions and heartfelt desires to him. The repetition found in the, this setting by Rollo Dilworth uh, that you're about to hear um, in these vocal phrases, it represents the voices of the dreamers who call upon the dream keeper for assistance. And the subsequent passages summon the dream keeper can be repeated again and again to, to rep a repetitious movement to uh, indicate summoning. And it's all within uh, a single type of rhythmic phrase. So it's, it's, it's almost like a brooding uh, summoning. So, uh, and also the blue cloud cloth, as you can see, the choir today is, is dressed in blue, um, uh, is a symbol of uh, vulnerability, that our most vulnerable dreams, um, asking someone to hold those for us, can be the most vulnerable and yet most powerful thing that we can do. Now please stand for our spoken benediction.
Evan Tracy Choir, thank you. Friends, as we go into this day and into this week, I invite you to open your hands as the welcoming Christ above us does eternally. May we live our lives with open hands, with open hearts. And through all of the harrowing violations that we see and we experience in our lives, and through the hallowed exaltations that we experience, may we know that love is ever-present and that love is who we are and that love will see us through and will guide us forward and will empower us to continue to be one people. So let's keep each other's dreams And let's follow those dreams and let's embody those dreams. Let's remember that we are the light of the world, the glitter on this globe. And may we shine. And may God bless us and keep us. May God's grace shine upon us. May God's face shine upon us. May God's grace shine within us. And may God's loving and life-giving presence be with us, within us, among us and around us, behind us, before us, and beyond us, this day and every day. And all of God's children say, Amen. Amen.